Hello and welcome to St. Clement's. I'm standing here next to this tablet to commemorate the life of Private Percy Hobson Fallick. And I'm standing here because of the verse from John's Gospel in it that ties in with what we're learning about the power of love from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Here's the verse from John's Gospel. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Of course, that is referring to Jesus, what he has done for us in lying down his life, dying for us on the cross in our place so that we can be forgiven. There's no greater love than that. We hope these short services help you to understand this great love of Jesus for us and to follow Jesus and live in the light of his love. That's the power of love. Thanks for watching. So Phil and I will read 1 Corinthians 12, half of it each. I'll be reading from verse 1 to 11, and Phil will continue on. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, 
Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honourable we clothe with greater honour, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honour to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts, and I will, I will show you a still more excellent way. Thanks, Phil. It's great to be able to look at this passage together with you. Uh, look, the passage was too long to put on one piece of paper, so the passage that Phil read for you was in your bulletin. You, you can refer to that if you like uh, at some point. I think most of what we're going to do, we're going to do on the screen, so you should be all right with all of that. So let me pray, and then we'll... I've got a great story for you. Uh, I think this opening story is a really interesting story, so I'll tell you that, and then we'll look at that together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the great opportunity that it is to come together to worship you and to hear your word, spoken, read, prayed about, sung. We pray as we spend some time thinking about that word now and reflecting upon it, that we would indeed uh, know clearly where we stand about, about gifts, about what they're for, about their goal, and about the fact that we should desire the gifts that most show love. So we would pray, Father, as we spend this time together, would you please bless it to us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, most of you will know that this is Martin Luther King, Jr. Martin Luther King, of course, is the famous guy who said, I have a dream and all that sort of thing. And at this point in time, he's a 29-year-old Alabama preacher who's just written a book called Strive Towards Freedom. He wanted to particularly write a story about the greatest mass action in US history. And the greatest mass action in US history is to do with the Montgomery bus boycott. If you know much about that, you'll know that uh, buses were segregated uh, in Montgomery. Uh, blacks could sit in one section and whites could sit in another section. And the Montgomery bus boycott, which was about the story of a woman, uh, Parks, her surname, Rosa, Rosie, Rosa Parks, Rosa, sat in the white section and all that sort of stuff. So he wrote a story about this and he went around America signing the copies of the book. Uh, this, is a, this is a true story. Um, basically in black bookstores. Now, for some unknown reason, when he gets to New York, he doesn't do this in a black bookstore. He does it in a white department store. I think it's got to do with the publishers. They put him in the shoe section because they don't really want him up front and all that sort of thing. And so he's signing the books. And into the store comes this woman whose name, her surname's Curry. Her first name's Isola Ware Curry. 
She was later to be diagnosed as paranoid and a schizophrenic. She has a gun concealed in her bra and she has a letter opener which has got a, quite a long blade on it concealed in her handbag. She walks up to Martin Luther King Jr. and she says, are you Martin Luther King? And he says, I am. And she stabs him right beside his aorta. It's not a fatal blow. It would have been fatal. It could have been fatal if the blade had been about an inch further away and all that sort of stuff. And there is a photo on the internet of him with the blade sticking out of, with the letter opener sticking out of his chest. But I am not that person to show you that. Uh, I try, I tried, I tried, I thought I'll show them this. And I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to show them this. Another stuff just makes me feel queasy. In order to recuperate, Martin Luther King goes to India. He wants to see what Gandhi's been doing. Gandhi, of course, has non violence. Gandhi has been particularly keen to fix up the untouchables and the fact that if you're an untouchable, you couldn't go into a Hindu temple. And in 1950, uh, Gandhi has legislated to allow untouchables to go into, a Hindu, into Hindu temples. And so Martin Luther King wants to go and see what's been happening there. He goes along to a class and the class teacher says, boys and girls, it's a great day today. We have a fellow untouchable who's come to speak to us. And the story goes that at that point, he realised that the land of the free had opposed a caste system not unlike the caste system of India, and that he had lived under that system all of his life. It was what lay beneath the forces he was fighting in America. And so Martin Luther King comes to realise it's not racism that it's his problem, not least of all because he got stabbed by a black woman. It was caste. Caste is what was destroying America. Now, I don't know all this because this is one of those great stories I've hidden away and not been able to share with you. It's because a new book's come out called Cast. It's by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Isabel Wilkinson. It's called, it's, I mean, uh, it's particularly important because of the Black Lives Matter thing. The book is called Cast, The Lies That Divide Us, The Origins of Our Discontents. And this is what she says. Caste is insidious and therefore powerful because it's not hatred, it's not necessarily personal. It is the worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations, patterns of a social order that have been in place for so long that looks like the natural order of things. And so what she's particularly interested in is the fact that in 2040, in the in in United States, there'll be more people of a black origin than there will be of a white origin. And she feels that they'll still vote for a white president because of caste. Now, what I want to say to you today, as we look at the story of, uh, we look at the issue of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, is that caste has no place in Christianity. You're going to see that God gives to every believer gifts. You're going to see that those gifts are given for the common good. You're going to see, I hope, that the common good is caring for one another. And you're going to see, I hope also, that you should desire the greater gifts, which are the ones that show love. But I hope that you see in this passage that we are not people who should be using our gifts for ourselves. We are not people who should be in superior or inferior with our gifts. That we should not be people who bring caste in any way into Christianity. Over the last few weeks, what we've been doing together is thinking about the power of love through 1 Corinthians, and indeed next week is 1 Corinthians 13, the great passage. This passage so sets that up. It so sets up to say, you, all Christians have gifts. Those gifts are indeed trumped or um, organised or what it is by, by love. Love must be why you use your gift. And so Andy's going to talk us about talk to us about 1 Corinthians 13 and the application of that in 1 Corinthians 14. 
But the thing he's going to see, you're going to see today is that there is a spiritual order of things. And whatever our natural order of things, whatever we might think in the society in which we live, that is not to be so in the church. And the church is a, to, be a per, to be a group of people who rejoices in the gifts that were given, who no one says, my gift's better than yours, and who no one says, your gift's better than mine. And so I hope that what you see is that great truth. So you're going to see four things. First of all, you're going to see that what unites us is a common word, that is, that Jesus is Lord, that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The second thing you're going to see is there is a common purpose in our gifts and that they are given for the good of all. Verse 7, then you're going to see that there needs to be a common mindset, which is care for one another. Gifts, common purpose, uh, the common purpose is to care for one another. And finally, I hope you see that there's going to be a common striving, which is love. So that's what we're going to look at together this morning. We start with a common word, which is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and I'm going to read to you the first three verses. Now, in my Bible, it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, but that's not in the original. It doesn't say gifts. It says, now concerning spiritual things. This is what he says. Now concerning spiritual things, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, through my 19 and a half years here, People have said to me, Stuart St. Clements doesn't seem a very spiritual church. I've flummoxed and, and mucked around and never known entirely what to say. And now as I come to the end of my time, I know what to say, which seems disappointing. I'm going to say 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. A spiritual church is a church which acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. The Spirit never draws attention to himself. There are no prayers to the Spirit in the New Testament. I'm not saying you can't pray to the Spirit. I'm just telling you there are no prayers to the Spirit in the New Testament. The, new, the work of the Spirit is to shine the light upon Jesus. And Paul says to the Corinthians, the first thing you need to know is that what the Spirit is doing in the Christian believer is acknowledging the Lordship of Christ. Every time you hear that Jesus is Lord, that has been the work of the Spirit of God. Every time you don't hear Jesus is Lord, then you know the Spirit is not working. Too frequently we think spiritual churches are the ones that talk all about the Spirit. I'm not anti-talking about the Spirit. I think, that's a, I think it's great to talk about God's Spirit. But... What the Spirit wants to do, what the Spirit's been sent to do, is to exalt the fact that Jesus is Lord. This, Paul says, is the common word for all Christians. Now you think about it in the first century. This is supposed to be the first creed ever. This Jesus is Lord is supposed to be the first creed that was ever invented. Think about the first century, they were all saying that Caesar is Lord. Suddenly the Apostle Paul comes along and says, the Christian person doesn't say Caesar is Lord, they say Jesus is Lord. And they do that by the Holy Spirit. It may be that he's sort of saying when people say Jesus is cursed, they said, well, Jesus died, he was cursed. Here we're saying Jesus is risen, he's king, he's sovereign, he's in control, and he's not left the not left the building. He's working through his people by his spirit, giving them the gifts that they need. And so the second thing that you find out in verse 7 is that the gifts are given for the common good. I do not think you should go through this list and try and find out which gift you have. I do not think that 1 Corinthians 12, and there are three other passages that tell you gifts, 
are a comprehensive list of gifts so that you can do gift 101 and tick off whichever one you've got. You have a gift. If you've put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you have been given a gift. And that gift is for the common good. I almost thought I might preach today and say, it's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. And sit down. But I decided not to do that, okay? Because, you know, I am supposed to do the right thing. But it's a gift. The Corinthians said, we want to be spiritual. Paul said, you've got a gift. And the reason you've got that gift is not because it makes you feel good, not because it's worthwhile using in the, in the secular world. It's because it's for the common good. It is to build the church. So it doesn't matter what gift you've got, whether it's a gift of admin, which I don't have really, which is a gift of preaching, whether it's a gift of healing, whether it's a gift of whatever. You have a gift, and that gift was given to the common good. When I first became a Christian, I became a Christian in 1974. Uh, I think I've told you this before. They didn't give me the Bible to read. They gave me a whole series of books to read. Uh, Corrie Ten Boom, of course, and then John White. Uh, one of his books was called The Cost of Commitment. I found it very persuasive. It had the story in it of a guy who was a communist. And it was a letter he sent to his fiancée to tell her that now he was a communist, he couldn't marry her. He said, communism's everything to me. I'm committed to the communist cause. To marry you would take me away from being a communist. I can't do that. And I have told this story time and time again. And I discovered this week, it's wrong. Because Christianity is not an individualistic religion. It's not about not being married. It's actually about being married to people. Not people who I'm, you know, legally married to, but about using the gift I've been given for the common good. To build people, to build up people, to bring them to a greater knowledge of Christ. So, there's a common word, which is Jesus is Lord. There's a common purpose that we've been given gifts. You have a different gift to me, I have a different gift to you. And that is for the good of all. That's why we're given our gift. Now, the result of that gift is that you will care for one another. Of course, this is Da Vinci, obviously, the Vitruvian man. The Vitruvian man is supposed to be the perfect body. That's why Da Vinci, the dimensions are perfect, Da Vinci said. And that's why he drew it with a circle and a square. Now, what Paul goes on to describe in Corinthians is the perfect body and the perfect body has people exercising their gifts to care for one another it's hard isn't it two issues are addressed one issue is the superior telling the inferior we really now, it starts off the inferior talking to the superior. The inferior says to the superior, really, I'm not of any use because I don't have your great gift. And the Bible says that's not true. The second situation is the superior addresses the inferior and says, your gift's not good, as good as mine. No, no. Caste has no role in Christianity what has a role in Christianity is using your gift for the common purpose, for the good of all. That's what makes for the perfect body. And it's really interesting because the Bible says that often the less presentable part gets a gift that makes them more honourable. 
And I was thinking about this during the week because it must have been an amazing thing because you think of those first century slaves and landowners and all that sort of stuff all coming together in the church. And can you imagine what it must have mean if the slave got the gift of preaching and the wealthy person got the gift of making the tea and coffee? You know, that's a real change to the order in society. And yet, that's what the Bible's saying. Common word, common purpose, common mindset, caring for one another. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who you know I've been reading, because James got, gave me the thickest book in known history to read. Really, I'm up to page 540. I've only got 418 to go. Really. People need to live shorter lives or something or other else, don't they, really? He, he, he is an evangelist, but he keeps arguing that if only the church really cared for one another, people would flock in. If they saw a real difference how people actually treated one another, they would... I'm not quite sure I agree with him entirely, but it's an interesting argument. So finally he says there needs to be a common striving. And you need to be asking the Lord to give you the gift and other, other gifts. And you need to be asking God to give you gifts that sh you can use that show more love. So he says, strive for the greater gifts. And the greater gifts are the ones that are able to show more charity, more love, more grace, more kindness. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Your thinking is wrong when you begin to think your gift is given for you. Your thinking is wrong when you think, I don't have that gift, so I'm inferior. Your thinking is wrong when you think, I've got that gift and I'm superior. There is no caste in Christianity. You know, and the, the great truth, isn't it, is that these are the gifts that we see in the Lord Jesus who died that you and I might be forgiven. And yet so many Christians you know, like take the forgiveness, the salvation, the redemption that Christ offers and they stop there. And, you know, Jesus himself said, unless your, your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And he means not only do we need a, the righteousness of Christ, but then having received the righteous of Christ, righteousness of Christ, we need to live righteous lives. And part of him giving our gifts is to lead righteous lives. Lots of people wrote to Martin Luther King, uh, presidents, heads of religious organisations and all that sort of stuff. A nine-year-old girl wrote to him and said, I'm so glad you didn't sneeze. And uh, on the 3rd of April 1968, Martin Luther King would preach... Uh, a, a sermon in Memphis, Tennessee in which he would constantly say I'm glad I didn't sneeze also because if I'd sneezed I wouldn't have seen this and if I sneezed I wouldn't have seen that and if I sneezed I wouldn't have seen the other I'm, I'm so glad I didn't sneeze as well and he said I just want to do God's will we will, we will get to the promised land. I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the, seen the coming, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, that should say. And he got shot the next day and was killed in the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Isabel Wilkinson, who tells this story, says, we change the world one heart at a time. Each time a person reaches across a caste, multiplied by millions in a given day, it becomes the flap of a butterfly, a flap of a butterfly wing that shifts the air, builds to a hurricane across the ocean, and levels the playing fields. She says, caste insulates the heart. The great danger of this whole series of sermons is that you might see Jesus as just an example. 
an example that you yourself can emulate and do, which will not happen because our hearts are indeed insulated. The great truth, of course, is that Jesus came into this world to die for us upon the cross and to rip out all that insulation of our hearts and to bring us, put us right with God as we said in the confession, to give us forgiveness and the gift of his Holy Spirit. And the gift of this Holy Spirit gives us gifts, gifts that we use for the common purpose and to care for one another, gifts that will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Paul says, use your gifts in this way and strive for the greatest gifts, which the gifts given with love. They said to Martin Luther King that they thought he was unusually calm when he got stabbed by the letter opener. He said, it was certainly not due to any extraordinary powers that I have. The power was of God working in me. If you could only see what God has done, then you'd see what you can do. Paul would say, it's not I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. The Spirit testifies to us that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's use our gifts to live out that great truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending Jesus into the world. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who draws his attention to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, Father, just help us to use the gifts that you've given to us for the common good, not for ourselves, to care for one another and to proclaim the Lordship of Christ. Thank you for all those who use their gifts. Please help us to strive to the gifts that show the greatest love. And we look forward to what we'll hear next week. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.